Patty McDaniel. Silver Screen Pioneer was one of the biggest Black American stars of the 1940s. During her controversial career, she appeared in over 300 films and starred in her own radio series, Beulah. She was also the first Black person to receive an Academy Award. Hattie McDaniel's Oscar victory is one that still resonates today. She was the first to break ground and pave the way for other Black actors to follow. Here is her story. Hattie McDaniel was born June 10, 1893 in Wichita, Kansas. She was the youngest of 13 children. The horrors of slavery and the Civil War haunted Hattie McDaniel's family. Both her parents, Susan and Henry, had been born into slavery in the Mid-Atlantic South. During the Civil War, Henry bravely joined the Tennessee 12th U.S. Colored Infantry Regiment, fighting for the Union at the brutal Battle of Nashville in 1864. Henry's jaw was shattered during the battle. Suffering from other injuries as well, Henry received little to no medical treatment after the war. He valiantly worked hard labor jobs despite his constant pain. According to McDaniel, the family was so poor that when she was born, she was malnourished, weighing only three and a half pounds. They moved to Denver, where the increasingly infirm Henry finally succeeded in receiving a small pension from the U.S. government for his military service after decades of trying. Although the McDaniel family often went hungry, they were tight-knit and creative. Hattie grew up singing in the church choir and attending integrated schools. I knew I can sing and dance, she recalled. I was doing it so much that my mother would give me a nickel sometimes to stop. She would also help her father fill out questionnaires for members of the government, who continually made it almost impossible for him to receive the pension and disability payments he deserved. In 1908, a government lackey maddeningly wrote that he could not increase Henry's pension since there was no official proof he had reached the age of 70. It is impossible for me to furnish a record of my birth, Henry wrote back succinctly. I was a slave. Despite constant hardships and discrimination, the McDaniel children became entertainment trailblazers in the Denver area, mounting plays and reviews for members of the black community. In 1914, Hattie and her sister Etta billed as the McDaniel Sisters Company, mounted an all-female menstrual show. The statuesque, agile Hattie developed a zany mammy character, a cultural critique of the racist archetype she would one day become famous for. Black audience members considered these menstrual routines to be hysterical spoofs of the white menstruals and its outlandish racial stereotypes. For the next two decades, McDaniel lived the hard scrabble life of a dedicated artist. In my life, she later said, God comes first, work second, and men third. During the 1920s, McDaniel refashioned herself into a sly, subversive blues singer, touted as the old pet machine and the sapia Sophie Tucker. In between treading the boards for the black vaudeville circuit and writing and recording blues songs, including Boo Hoo Blues and Dentist Chair Blues, she would take jobs as a domestic worker or a cook to make ends meet. In 1929, McDaniel was traveling the country as part of the chorus and the Florin Zigfield Touring Company of Showboat when the stock market crash forced the famed producer to let most of his performers go. Stranded in unfamiliar Milwaukee, McDaniel got a job as a restroom attendant at the nightclub Sam Pick's Suburban Inn. One night, all the singers had left before closing and the management needed an act. McDaniel stepped in and brought the house down with her rendition of St. Louis Blues. Hired on the spot, she headlined at the end for two years before it was forced to close during the depression. Out of work once again, McDaniel packed her bags with $20 in her purse and hopped on the bus headed to Hollywood. Hattie's brother, Sam McDaniel was a successful Hollywood actor. He found her a small role on a local radio show, The Optimistic Do Nuts. Known as Hi Hat Hattie, she became the show's main attraction before long. She landed her first uncredited role in a film and patient maiden in 1932. Two years later, she saw her name in credits for the first time in the film Judge Priest, but it was misspelled as McDaniels. 
This perhaps foreshadowed the controversies she'd experienced in her career. In the 1930s, McDaniel was a go-to actress to play comedic, sassy maids and mammy characters, roles that were usually derogatory and servile. But after years of struggle and uncertainty, McDaniel was pragmatic. I can be a maid for $7 a week, she said, or I can play a maid for $700 a week. Like most African Americans in the Lily White film industry of the time, McDaniel was primarily typecast as the help. In fact, she would play a maid 74 different times throughout her career. In 1937, Hollywood was all a Twitter about the casting of David O. Selznick's version of Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind. A coy suggestion came from Hattie's brother, a good friend of Bing Crosby. Why not, Crosby asked Selznick, use that woman who played Queenie in a recent film version of Showboat. The famous crooner claimed he did not know her name, but thought she would be a good choice. From the time her casting was announced, McDaniel faced harsh criticism from influential members of the black community. We feel proud over the fact that Hattie McDaniel won the coveted role of Mammy, wrote Earl Morris of the Pittsburgh Courier. It means about $2,000 for Miss McDaniel in individual advancement and nothing in racial advancement. Much of the cast banded together during the grueling shoot. Black cast members were particularly supportive of one another, gathering around to watch each other's takes and applauding after the camera stopped. McDaniel was used by the studio to assuage the black civil rights leaders who worried the film would further promote racist stereotypes. Don't worry, she reportedly said, according to one studio press release. There's nothing in this picture that would injure colored people if there was, I wouldn't be in it. When co-star Butterfly McQueen rebelled against her demanding character Prissy, intentionally flubbing lines and demanding that star Vivian Lee apologize after a stinging on-screen slap, McDaniel canceled caution. McQueen later claimed McDaniel took her aside and warned her, you'll never come back to Hollywood you complain too much. Selznick quickly realized that McDaniel was a standout in the film. Still, he acquiesced to the city of Atlanta's demand that no black actors attend the movie's December 15, 1939 premiere. McDaniel and Clark Gable forged a close friendship during the filming of 1935's China Seas. When Gable, who loved pranking her, learned his co-star wasn't welcome at the Gone with the Wind's 1939 premiere, he refused to go. Only at McDaniel's urging did he relent. Had he received a telegram from the Gone with the Wind author, Margaret Mitchell, who wrote, Wish you could have heard the applause. Weeks after the film's release, McDaniel marched into Selznick's office and showed him the notices of her performance and asked if he agreed with him to put her name in a running for the Best Supporting Actress Oscar. That gutsy, well-timed move resulted in her Academy Award win. The 12th annual Academy Awards took place at the Ambassador Hotel, which had a strict no blacks policy at the time. Subsequently, when McDaniel arrived, she was escorted away from the Gone with Wind table and had to instead sit at a small table set against the wall where she was joined by her escort and her white agent. Despite the blatant injustice, McDaniel delivered an emotional acceptance speech. This is one of the happiest moments of my life. And I want to thank each one of you who had a part in selecting me for one of the awards. For your kindness, it has made me feel very, very humble. And I shall always hold it as a beacon for anything that I may be able to do in the future. I sincerely hope I shall always be a credit to my race and to the motion picture industry. My heart is too full to tell you just how I feel. And may I say thank you and God bless you. McDaniel's historic Oscar win was a double-edged sword. It locked her into an increasingly personal feud with Walter White, the erudite, sophisticated leader of the NAACP. Black and some white intellectuals had long railed against the demeaning, stereotypical roles actors like McDaniel, Lincoln Perry, better known as Stephen Fetchett, and her good friend Louise Beavers played. White himself called on black actors to stop mugging and playing clown before the camera. At a 1942 NAACP meeting in Los Angeles, 
in front of 10,000 delegates, including McDaniel, White stood on stage with Hollywood newcomer Lena Horne, conventionally beautiful, cultured, and light-skinned, whom he believed to be the ideal modern black film star, a concept informed in part by colorism and classism within the black community itself. In his speech, he explained that he had been negotiating directly with studios to change the roles available to black actors in Hollywood. McDaniel was incensed, believing that it was she and other fellow black SAG actors who should be negotiating with studio execs, not white. I have no quarrel with the NAACP or colored fans who object to the roles some of us play, but I naturally resent being completely ignored at the convention, she said. I have struggled for 11 years to open up opportunities for our group in the industry and I have tried to reflect credit upon my race and exemplary conduct both on and off screen. McDaniel was mainly angered that she was the only actor White explicitly called out. She accused him of treating her with the same tone and manner that a Southern Colonel would use to his favorite slave. Indeed. White did little to smooth over the situation after viewing In This Is Our Life, a 1942 film in which McDaniel gives a stellar performance as the mother of a brilliant son targeted because of his race. White did not reach out to McDaniel, but he did write to her co-star Olivia de Hollivant to commend her on the film. Things came to a head in January 1946 when White held a summit with black actors, including Lena Horne and Sam McDaniel. Hattie did not attend. I cannot accept your invitation to break bread with Walter White, she wrote in response to the invitation, for he has openly insulted my intelligence. At her core, McDaniel was hurt by what she saw as White's disparagement of her artistic accomplishments. God has endowed me with other talent, she said, which Walter White and no other persons know nothing of, and they are not menial, as he has said. While McDaniel was feuding openly with the national head of the NAACP, she was working closely with the group's Los Angeles branch to save her mansion in Sugar Hill, a neighborhood of stately Victorian homes that had become the black Beverly Hills. I'm a fine mammy on screen, but I'm Hattie McDaniel in my house, she told Lena Horne. Generous to a fault, she was known as an avid supporter of the war effort and black causes. I got friends that I love and need like I hope they love and need me, she said. Always immaculately dressed, with her beloved down nations nearby, McDaniel was a legendary hostess. She had the most exquisite house I had ever seen in my life, the best of everything, Lena Horne recalled. At her parties, her close friends, Clark Gable, Cab Calloway, Luetta Parsons, Paul Robeson, Bing Crosby, Louise Beavers, Duke Ellington, and Esther Williams broke colored lines in segregated Hollywood. South Harvard became a salon where black artists, including the host herself, could resist white domination of their talents. But in 1945, homeowners in the area began to attempt to push black residents out of their homes, claiming that restrictive covenants barred them from the neighborhood. McDaniel took the lead in fighting the racist attack, organizing neighbors like Louise Beavers and Ethel Waters, and hosting meetings in her home. On December 5, 1945, McDaniel and a group of over 200 supporters were in the courtroom when legendary lawyer Lauren Miller argued successfully that racial restrictive deeds and covenants were unconstitutional, thus opening the door for the end of such residential segregation throughout the United States. By the late 1940s, McDaniel was conflicted professionally and personally. She experienced a false pregnancy at the age of 51 and racked up two more failed marriages. She was married five times in total According to her best friend, Ruby Goodwin, there were bitter years of loneliness and disillusionment when she thought her race did not appreciate her artistry. McDaniel continued to defend her life's work. How can one in your profession not know that millions of Negroes in this country are employed in domestic roles? She asked a reporter in 1949. 
Surely you don't think the roles I play are obsolete. But she continued to be a hit with predominantly white audiences. In 1947, she took over the particular role of the hit CBS radio show Beulah, originally played by a white man, where she played a cheerful problem-solving maid for a white family. But by the early 1950s, complications from diabetes as well as breast cancer caused her to be the first black performer to move into the motion picture country home. She jokingly claimed she wanted her epitaph to read, well, I played everything but the harp. McDaniel stipulated that she wanted to be buried in Hollywood Forever Cemetery, where white film stars like Douglas Fairbanks and Rudolph Valentino rested. Always a realist, she knew that she would probably be turned away and chose Rosedale Cemetery as her second choice. She soon slipped into a coma and died on October 26, 1952. She was buried in Rosedale. However, a cenotaph of her was placed in Hollywood Forever in 1999. Despite the criticism, Hattie McDaniel believed that she had done what she could to make space for other black actors. Biographer Jill Watts told NPR that McDaniel had an open door policy with fellow African American creatives at her Los Angeles home. Within the walls of her home, they're able to perform the way they want to perform, Watts explained. This is post Academy Award for the first few years. I think she was quite hopeful and she wanted to share that success with others. She supported family, friends, People talk about how people would just come to her and she would give out the money she had. So she's quite generous in that way. As chairman of the Black Division of Hollywood Victory Committee, the actress organized shows for African-American troops deployed in World War II and donated generous sums of money to the NAACP despite their public criticisms of her. She donated to educational causes and scholarships for her sorority Sigma Gamma Rho. McDaniel has two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, one for her contributions to radio and one for motion pictures. In 1975, she was inducted into the Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame. In 2006, the United States Postal Service issued a commemorative postage stamp in honor of Hattie McDaniel's legendary life and achievements. In The View, of the 21st century lens. Some people have mixed feelings about Hattie McDaniel's work, which is often reduced to her simply perpetuating racist and offensive stereotypes. Film director Spike Lee sheds insight into the complexity of her work and contribution. He referred to Miss McDaniel as a great talent, working with the best that was being offered to them at the time. On Modern Representation, Lee noted, we should have greater understanding for those people of the past. We have choices, a lot more than they had. Hattie McDaniel left behind a remarkable, complicated legacy of artistry and perseverance. In a world full of limits to dark-skinned, full-figured women, she made her own way. Through the rugged and harsh terrain of racism, sexism, colorism, and apartheid Jim Crow. Even though her characters were trapped, in the white imagination, her talent managed to break free. She was more than a mammy. She was a resolute artist and trailblazer. Hattie McDaniel, pioneer of the silver screen and Onyx Queen. If you enjoyed this video, please share, like, and subscribe to this channel. Thank you for watching.